Welcome to Saturday Story Circle, always on the Mutual Audio Network. The following audio drama is rated G for general audience. Chapter 3 Abigail woke up ready for an argument. She sat quietly in her bed, remembering the points that she had organized in her mind the night before. The Beech Nut Street Detective Agency would not go down without a fight, no question about it. Abigail was ready. She dressed quickly and ran a brush through her hair, enough to calm it down for the casual observer, without really taking the time to address some of the more serious tangles. She took the stairs two at a time and landed in the hall outside the kitchen, ready for anything. Except all that she saw was her father's back, seated at the kitchen table, eating a bowl of cereal. "'Good morning, sweetheart,' he said, reading the newspaper, which was carefully folded on the table in front of him. "'Morning, Daddy,' she said, slightly confused. Her mother could not possibly still be in the shower, not at this hour, but there was no sign of her anywhere. Abigail felt a bit like her entrance had been spoiled, and wondered if it would be too obvious to go back upstairs and come in again when she heard her mother's voice. She stood quietly for a moment, not knowing quite what to do with herself. Her father said nothing, and seemed to be finishing up what he was reading. Abigail could tell that he was trying to finish quickly before he was interrupted, because he leaned forward slightly as if being closer to the words would help him read all of them faster— she turned and walked down the front hall and opened the door. Abigail popped her head out and confirmed her suspicions. The car was already gone. "'Where's Mom?' Abigail asked as she returned to the kitchen. Her father had now put the paper away and seemed to be waiting for her, which he disguised by casually fishing for the last bits of cereal floating in his milk. "'She had to go into work early,' her father replied. "'She got a text last night.' Abigail's eyes narrowed. "'I thought she said she was going to stop checking work email at night,' she said. "'She did,' her father smiled. "'That's why they sent her a text.' "'Oh,' Abigail said simply and stood there blinking. "'What's wrong?' her father asked. "'Nothing,' Abigail said, surprised. Her father grinned. "'So, you came downstairs with your knuckles all lined up for a fight, did you?' he said, standing and taking his cereal bowl over to the sink. No, Abigail protested, a bit too much to be believed. Ah, her father said, in the aggravating way that he had of agreeing with you when he didn't really agree with you to stop you from arguing the point. Abigail noticed that her father was getting a different bowl out of the cupboard and a spoon. You know, I can get my own cereal, she said. Yes, he agreed, pouring it, but you weren't. Abigail sighed and turned to the refrigerator to get the milk before he could do that, too. Just promise me that you won't sit in the garage all day like a mushroom, her father said, still smiling. I won't, Abigail agreed. I will only stay in the office until I have a case. She poured milk on her cereal, put the milk back in the refrigerator, and sat down to eat. Right. Her father took a breath and started over a little. You know, I used to read a detective series where the fellow had an outer office that he kept unlocked so people could come in and wait for him when he wasn't there. Abigail frowned as she ate. Why didn't they just leave a voicemail? Her father looked surprised. There was no voicemail back then. Oh, said Abigail, losing interest. The olden days. Sounds barbaric. Well, her father said defensively, technically, you don't have voicemail either. Abigail nodded. I've been meaning to talk to you about that, she said. I am not getting you a phone, her father said with a grimace. Not even for the detective agency, she asked. Especially not for the detective agency, he agreed. Abigail made a face and kept eating. My point is, her father said, you don't really need to be there every second of every day. Abigail narrowed her eyes at him. "'How will people hire me if they can't talk to me?' she asked. Her father cleared his throat. "'Well, <coughs> maybe we shouldn't worry too much about that.' Abigail frowned, her best frown at her father, and he seemed to wilt a little, like a plant in the hot sun. 
You don't think I'm going to get any cases, do you? She asked sternly. He sighed and leaned against the counter. No, I do not, Miss Abigail, he said. And that is not a reflection on your abilities. It is based on my observation that Beechnut Street is not exactly a hotbed of criminal activity. I am not giving up the detective agency, Abigail said calmly, meeting her father's eyes. He was quiet for a moment. Of course you aren't, he nodded. You have to see this through. Abigail was so surprised she forgot to say anything at all. Just don't get in your mother's face with it. Okay, he said with a smile. It takes her a while to get used to change, but she gets there in the end. What change? Abigail blinked. The detective agency? Sure, her father said cryptically, and he kissed her on the forehead and left for work. And so it was that the Beech Nut Street Detective Agency lived to see another day. And Abigail Brannigan, proprietor, Penguin walked the sign down the driveway at 8.32. At 8.55, Abigail heard the sound of wheels approaching at speed, and something else. Something strange. A kind of clicking, chirping noise that was almost like a bird, except it wasn't, and Abigail knew it. The orange helmet rolled into view, and an instant later, the small girl underneath it appeared from around the shrubs, and Abigail could see at once that the noise was coming from her, although exactly why and how, Abigail could only guess at. The girl stomped to a halt halfway up the driveway. Abigail stood and walked toward the open door. Hey, she said with a nod. You stood me up. The girl's eyes flashed with anger. My mother wouldn't let me out, she said. Mothers can be like that, Abigail agreed. Where does she think you are now? She knows I'm riding down Beechnut Street, the girl said. I have fifteen minutes. What a coincidence, Abigail said flatly. I have fifteen minutes myself. Step into my office. The girl picked up the long board and carried it into the garage. Abigail was about to tell her to have a seat when she suddenly realized that she did not have a chair on the client side of the desk. There was another folding metal chair, identical to the one behind the desk, but it was in the furnace room in the basement where Abigail had found this one. If the girl with a skateboard was on the clock, she wouldn't want to take five minutes to get seated. Let me grab you a chair, Abigail said, walking toward the back of the room and hoping that the old lawn chairs were still in the usual place. You haven't been in business long, the girl said as a statement, not a question. Just open this week, Abigail said, pulling out the lawn chair she remembered as being the least squeaky from the pile. How many cases have you solved, the girl said with a skeptical eye. I can't tell you that, Abigail said breezily. Client confidentiality. The girl frowned. I don't know what that means, she said. Abigail pulled the lawn chair open and set it down. It means I can't discuss my clients with you or with anyone else, just like I won't be able to discuss your case either. This is a very discreet agency. The girl nodded and sat down. Abigail made her way to the other side of the desk and took her seat. She noted with some dismay that she could barely see the top of her client's head from this angle. The chair is a little bit low, the girl said. Do you want to switch? Abigail offered. Yes, please, said the girl. Abigail picked up her notebook and pencil and traded seats with the girl. This arrangement worked considerably better as Abigail was very tall. However, she would not be able to set the book on the tabletop to make notes. She opened her notebook and set it on her knee, as much as possible as if that was how she did things all the time, on the many, many other occasions when a client had come to call. She looked up. The girl had removed her helmet and set it on the desk. Without it, her hair stood out in every direction at once, as if she were receiving an electric shock. "'My hair's gone weird, hasn't it?' she asked flatly. "'Yes,' Abigail admitted. The girl tried to press her hair back into some kind of shape, but she did so blindly and without much care for her actual appearance. Abigail looked down at the skateboard on the floor beside the lawn chair. It was, in fact, a Chinese dragon on the board— and some kind of word written in fake graffiti lettering which Abigail could not decipher. Nice longboard, Abigail offered. The girl snorted. <laughs> Thanks, she said. It was my older brother's. He took my oldest brother's board when he left for college, and I got this. I'd rather have a bike. You have two brothers? Abigail asked, making notes. I have three brothers, 
the girl said. My older brother, my oldest brother, and the other one. Sisters? Abigail asked. The girl shook her head. Is this important? Everything is important, Abigail said, looking over the top of her notebook. But let's start with your name. Karen, the girl said. I'm Karen Hightower. I'm eight years old. Abigail nodded and wrote, Where do you live, Miss Hightower? Abigail had decided to call all of her clients by their last names when she finally had some. It seemed like the professional way to do things. The girl was suitably impressed. Fifty-two Sycamore, she said. Abigail raised an eyebrow. You're out of your neighborhood, she observed. The girl nodded. That's why I only have a few minutes, she said. My mother only lets me out to search a few times a day. I have to tell her exactly where I'm going, and I have to be back twenty minutes after I left. That's why I started riding the longboard. I can look farther from the house. Abigail nodded. Let's back up a step, she said. You're searching for something. That's why I'm here, the girl said seriously. I've looked every day, and there's only so much I can do. No one else will look with me any more, and now I'm only allowed out to look on my own for twenty minutes at a time, four, maybe five times a day. It isn't working. Abigail nodded, making notes, which was harder than she thought it would be because the girl was talking much faster than her teacher did at school, and Abigail did not want to miss any details that might be important later on. It was difficult to write neatly, holding the book on her lap like this, and Abigail always took a certain pride in her penmanship that she was simply going to have to sacrifice in this job. That much was clear. Abigail decided to make hasty notes and rewrite them later. She looked up from her book and saw her client regarding her suspiciously. "'What are you writing about all the time?' Karen asked, her eyes narrowing, as if she was not being taken seriously. "'I apologize, Miss Hightower,' Abigail said. "'At this point I have to assume that every detail is relevant. But there is one very important thing you haven't told me yet.' "'What's that?' the girl asked. "'I still don't know what you're looking for,' Abigail admitted." The girl nodded and reached into her back pocket. She unfolded a piece of yellow paper, which turned out to be a photocopied poster, the kind people hang on lamp posts and message boards. It said, Missing Cat! Zeke! Please call! There was a phone number and a picture of a cat, which was not very good because it was a black and white photocopy of a color picture of a cat, sitting looking at something intently, just off the camera. And unless the cat was naturally yellow, the colored paper was not helping a great deal, though Abigail assumed that was meant to get people to look at the poster in the first place. The bottom of the paper was divided up into eight or ten areas that could be cut up into strips, so passers-by could keep the phone number handy in case they saw the cat. This poster had not been cut into strips at the bottom yet, but each of the areas was helpfully divided with dotted lines for eventual cutting, and each of the strips said Zeke and had the phone number again. "'Zeke is your cat?' Abigail asked, looking at the poster. "'Ezekiel,' the girl corrected. "'Everyone else calls him Zeke, but he's my cat, and his name is Ezekiel.' Abigail nodded and made a quick note. "'Does a cat know his name?' she asked. Karen shrugged. "'He's a cat,' she said. "'Who can tell what he knows? A cat isn't like a dog. A dog is always trying to impress you with how much it knows.' A cat can keep a secret. Abigail nodded. Yes, ma'am, she said. What I meant was, if I were looking for the cat, should I call for Zeke or Ezekiel? He doesn't come when you call his name, the girl said. He comes when you shake a bag of treats, or when you do this. The girl then made the sound again. Even watching up close, Abigail could not tell how she was doing it. But there it was, somewhere between a click and a cluck and the girl made it a dozen more times quickly, with increasing volume, until Abigail waved for her to stop. I don't think I can make that sound, Abigail admitted. No one else can, Karen said. That's why he's my cat. Abigail made notes. How do the others look for him, she asked. Do they shake bags of treats? Karen shrugged. They used to, she said, when they were looking. But sometimes it made people mad because all the cats on the street would come running. "'And no one is looking for the cat now?' Abigail asked. "'No,' the girl said glumly. "'He's been gone for three weeks. "'They all say that he'll come back on his own, "'but they really think he'll never come back.' 
What do you think? Abigail asked. I think I want my cat back, the girl said, and I can't do it alone. You know that I can't promise to find Ezekiel, Abigail said. All that I can promise is to work hard and try my best. That's all I ask, the girl said seriously. I can't do it on my own. Abigail regarded her new client quietly. The girl looked small and sad. As disappointing as a lost cat case might seem, there was no question that this girl needed her help. Abigail asked her to wait a moment, and she stepped into the house. She came back less than a minute later, slipping two fresh double-A batteries into her prize. It was a small tape recorder, the kind that used actual tape. Abigail's father had used it to record lectures when he was at university. He had dug it out in case her brother wanted it for the same purpose, but Jeremy was appalled by the idea of using something so old. Abigail was not a snob, and to her the tape recorder seemed like the very thing. "'Can you make that noise for me again, Miss Hightower?' Abigail asked. "'The one you make when you're calling Ezekiel?' "'Why?' The girl was confused and skeptical. "'Because I'm going to record you.' Abigail said, and I'm going to play back the recording while I'm looking for Ezekiel, and it will be exactly as if you are calling him yourself wherever I go. The girl looked up at Abigail with eyes that were full of wonder, which seemed to Abigail to be more than she deserved, but she was pleased all the same. The girl made her clucking noise and called to her cat into the recorder for nearly four minutes straight, because, as Abigail explained, when the recording ran out, she would need to rewind the tape every time. But eventually, both of them were satisfied, and Abigail turned off the recorder. "'Thank you, Miss Brannigan,' the girl said, picking up some of the formality that Abigail was using. "'I don't know what I would have done without you.' "'I haven't done anything yet,' Abigail warned her. "'I just need to ask a few more things.' "'Okay,' the girl nodded. "'Just to save my time and your money,' Abigail said, "'can I assume that you have already checked in with the usual places, the Humane Society and such?' The girl nodded. Yes, she said. They know about Ezekiel. We left a photo, and they have his chip number. They put the picture on their website. If anyone found him and wanted to turn him in, it wouldn't be hard to find me. I see, Abigail nodded. Forgive me, I don't mean to upset you, but would they also know if a cat were hit by a car, even if it couldn't be saved? I know about this, Miss Brannigan, the girl said. When something like that happens, the city sends people called Animal Control, and they check in with the Humane Society. Ezekiel is chipped. If he had been hit by a car, we would know about it. You said twice that he was chipped, Abigail frowned. What do you mean by that? Microchipped, the girl explained. They put something into the back of his neck, and if it's scanned, they know who he is and who he belongs to. So I know he isn't at the pound, and I know he isn't dead. He's out there somewhere, Miss Brannigan, and he needs me. Abigail nodded. I'll need a better picture than this, Abigail said, picking up the yellow poster. Preferably something in the right color. I'll need to show it to people. The better the picture, the better the chance that they'll remember seeing Ezekiel. The girl reached into her pocket and took out a photograph. She passed it to Abigail with a trembling hand. The cat in the picture was bright orange, and had an intelligent expression on his face. He seemed like a nice cat, if you like that sort of thing, and the kind of cat you might very much want to have back if you were Karen Hightower. I need that pack, the girl said, her voice catching. Whatever happens, I need that back. It's the best picture that I have of him. I'll take good care of it, Abigail nodded. There was one last part of the conversation, and it felt very awkward. The detectives in books always just seemed to blurt it out, and Abigail wondered if it was because they felt awkward, too. <sighs> she supposed she would have to try it. I get a dollar a day, she said, plus expenses. It wasn't very much, but Abigail didn't think she could expect to ask for more. The girl frowned. I don't know what expenses means, she said. Abigail had read about this in the books, and it was just something that detectives say, but she supposed that having introduced the idea, she really ought to explain it properly. It means that if I have to spend anything in the course of the investigation, you agree to reimburse me for the expense. The girl frowned. Does reimburse mean that I pay you back? she asked. 
Yes, Abigail nodded. Well, I only have four dollars and about eighty cents, the girl said. So maybe you should check with me before you spend anything? Abigail nodded. That's fair, she agreed. My mom is offering a reward if he's found, the girl said, digging into her pocket and producing a small handful of coins, which she began to sort. That won't be necessary, Miss Hightower, Abigail said. I'm just doing my job. Miss Hightower nodded and held out a dollar, mostly in quarters, which Abigail accepted. When can you start? her client asked. I just did, the detective replied. Hello, I'm John Bell of Bells in the Battery, along with my associates, Arnie Kunchbein. I can introduce myself. Thank you very much. All right. Hi, I'm Arnie Kunchbein. That's it? That's it. And also, do you want me to introduce you, Brad? Well, of course, Mr. Bell. That's your job as host. Thank you, Brad. And I'd like to introduce Brad... Hold it. What? Here's your script. Script? (laughs) Well, you gotta know what to say. All right. And introducing Brad Montworth, a salesman, incomparable public relations expert, and, of course, unrivaled attorney at law. No, come on, you know how to say it, Mr. Bell. Unrivaled attorney Attorney at 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 law. law. Oh, Mr. Bell, you shouldn't say those things. You make me blush. Can I do my introduction over again? No. We're here for an important reason. Very important. Indeed. If you think you deserve significant financial compensation, call Brad Motworth, attorney, attorney at attorney law. law. Oh, boy. At 5554. No, 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 no. We're here to remind everybody to take steps to avoid the coronavirus. Yeah, don't catch it. Because there's no one you can sue. Wash your hands thoroughly and keep social distancing. What? Social distancing. One more time. Stay about six feet away from everybody else. Right, very good. Oh, I gotta wash my hands thoroughly. I don't wanna get me this corona. Ooh, keep your distance now. Socially. I wanna keep feeling fine. Corona. Never gonna stop getting squirts from my Purell. I'm always gonna buy all the toilet paper that they sell. Bye, 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 Corona. Don't get no closer, huh? Beat it, huh? Far enough where I can't see your eyes, Corona. An illness history is not for me, uh-uh. Don't want to try your COVID on for size, Corona. Never gonna touch, stay away, my epidermis. Never wants to be close to where that nasty germ is. Bye, 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 woo. Fly Corona! Fly Corona! Captain Fly Corona! Pumpkin Pie Corona! Now wait a minute! Fly Corona! Goodbye Corona! Good riddance!